I'm going to tell you, heaven gets sweeter every day that passes by. And I know that we can't fully grasp right now what it's going to be to be able to see the glory of who Jesus is. Amen. And understand what it's going to mean when all other things fall before Him. The things that people have held dear. The false gods that people have worshipped. And what felt so important to them, they're all going to fade and pass away. That glorious day when He is crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it's going to be the church. It's going to be the blood washed. Amen. That will crown Him. Amen. And sing to Him redemption song. And what a time it's going to be. And glory in that day. Nothing like we've ever experienced before. Church, Jesus is coming soon. Amen. If you're not ready, if you're not sure, today's a good day to be sure. To make your calling and election sure with Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. It's no time to delay. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Luke in chapter 22. The book of Luke in chapter 22. Brother, I want to obey God. Go ahead. Thank the Lord. Glory. You know, we can make a place, a dreadful place, brother. We can even lay our head on a rock, as Jacob did. But God will show you there's a way of repentance through the ladder of Christ to heaven. That's the only way we'll get to heaven, church. We got to make our calling and make sure, as you said, brother, that our hearts are right before God, and there's no sin in our life. For God is not pleased with sin; God is drowned on that thing. But God has made a way that we should go to heaven. That is through Christ Jesus. That lineage. That's the only way we'll go to heaven. So you can make your bed in hell. He said he'd be right there. That awful place that you have allowed yourself to be drugged by sin. But God is right there wanting to save you this morning. Right. He's wanting to bring us to a place that we can be a workman into yeah. God and to goodness of the yeah. Lord. That God yeah. is working through us and show us the ways that we can lead others to That's the Lord. Right. So church, I want you to listen to the preacher today. And make yeah. him call it the election. Sure, brother, go ahead and thank God now. Amen. The book of Luke in chapter 22. And let's go to verse 31. Luke 22 and verse 31. Very familiar passage of scripture to you today. Jesus, right before his trip to Gethsemane, is talking with disciples and specifically here, he's talking to Simon Peter. And he says these words, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for thee. That thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. You may be seated. For a few moments this morning, I want to preach to you along this thought. I want to preach to you about the prayer that changed everything. The prayer that changed everything. We all have our idea. Of where we are in our walk with Jesus Christ the Lord. There are different levels I would say. As I come to you this morning. And you know I'm just taking just a consensus of uh, of what we see. What we know. What we understand to be. There are those that are red hot. There are those that are burning. And then there are those that are just simmering. You know, all kind of different levels in our relationship to Jesus Christ the Lord. The Bible has called us that if we're going to be in a true position of worship, in a true position of discipleship to Jesus Christ the Lord, the Word has called us to that position of red hot. Right? Those other two places are places of danger. There are places that we can we find that trouble easily comes and distracts us, deters us, even causes us to stumble. 
But when we're in a place that we are red hot for Jesus Christ the Lord, we find that our attention is consumed with the Lord Jesus and it's hard for the enemy to distract us. When your mind, when your heart is fixed on the Lord, is what I'm saying, it's harder for the enemy to get a wedge in there to distract you from your journey with Jesus Christ the Lord. It's when we give Him audience, it's when we give Him credence, it's when we give Him that capacity to whisper in our ear and we begin to listen to what He says. I understand better today than I've ever understood it that an idle mind is the devil's playground. And when you think about an idle mind, an idle mind is this, it's a mind that is not fixed upon the Lord. It is a mind that is open to suggestion. It is a mind that is open, amen, to whatever somebody's got to plant a seed in there. And can I tell you tonight that the devil, when he plants his seeds, they're already fertilized. Right? You don't have to come back and give them juice. They're already loaded when they get there. And when we allow the enemy just to constantly bombard our minds pretty soon, he's convinced us that we're isolated, we're alone, and nobody loves us, and nobody cares about us, and we're this, and we're that, and everything negative in our life, and everything where we have no purpose, we have no calling, We have no this. We have no that. Life is just a drag. I don't even know why I'm here. I don't even know why I'm breathing. All of these things do not come from you, friend. They come from your adversary, the devil. He puts them in our minds. And when we give him that opportunity, he causes them to grow. Now, what do all of these things do? All of these things create a gap. They create a wedge between us and the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of these things to get rid of them, to get the land cleared, constitutes prayer. And I'm talking about fervent prayer. I'm talking about time spent with Jesus Christ to clean your minds out from the travesty of what the enemy has done to you. Now back in days that were far before I ever came along, and probably some of you, uh, all of the farmland around here wasn't cleared. There were times where there was a time when people had to clear their land because they couldn't live off of trees. They couldn't live off of bushes, and they couldn't live off of weeds. And so they had to clear their lands for homes. They had to clear their lands for crops. They had to clear their lands for cattle. They had to clear their land for general purposes of survival. But those things didn't happen overnight, did they? They took months. They took years. uh, Probably the greater parts of their lives that they didn't enjoy the fullness of it, but those that came behind them reaped the benefits of their work. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. I'm telling you, amen, it's a fight today that we've got, amen, to embrace the idea that it is our duty to keep our minds clear, amen, from the attacks of the enemy. How am I going to do that? Amen. I'm going to give my heart, my mind, I'm going to give my being to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to fill my heart, amen, with the things of God. Amen. I'm going to concentrate on the Word of God. I'm going to seek the peace of God. Amen. And with the peace of God, amen, I can live a profitable and a prosperous life. What I'm saying is, is that I'm going to build a defense against the enemy by and through the name and the power of Jesus Christ the Lord. I've said all that, amen, for a reason this morning. Because I want to submit to you that as Jesus was talking to Peter, Peter was not in a place where he was uh, uh, warm, where Peter was not in a place where he was simmering. But I want you to understand that in this time that Jesus is speaking to Peter, he's red hot. He's with the Son of God. He is with the Savior. He has seen more miracles and accounts and acts of the Almighty. 
Amen. That could ever be written down on paper. And he is full of the fire of God. And when Peter speaks to Jesus and tells Jesus that, Lord, I'll die for you. I believe it with every core of my, every fiber of my being this morning that G, that Peter would die for the cause of Jesus Christ the Lord. But there's something I want, amen, you to see today. There's something I want you to realize today that Satan did concerning Peter. The Bible says that Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Simon, he said, Satan hath desired to have you. Do you know what he was saying? He said this. He said, Simon Peter, Satan hath begged me for me to turn you over to him that he may sift you until you quit. That he may try your faith till you give up. That's exactly what he has desired to have you mean. That He has begged me for you. Kind of brings a new light to it, doesn't it? Yes, sir. A new understanding that Satan knew that if he could tear Peter down, that all the rest of them would be like dominoes. And that they would come tumbling down to that He would destroy this work that Jesus Christ had sought to set up in his three and a half years of ministry. And so what do I find here? When he said that he may sift you as wheat. I, I know something about seed cleaning. I, I clean seed. I clean wheat seed. I, I go through the process of cleaning wheat seed. I go through the process of cleaning soybeans. So I know what it is. Amen. To put them through a process where the chaff is taken out and the seed is separated. It's a, it's a process that goes through uh, several things and, and several sieves, if you will. Uh, it's not just one seed, but it's several that gets the broken seeds and only allows the whole seed to come through and it separates all the other trash. I know what it is. I have to take buckets upon buckets upon buckets of trash and dump them, amen, somewhere else, amen, as the seed is being prepared. And so what I find today that the devil wanted to have him, that he may destroy him. And Jesus did not deny him. Jesus did not tell Satan no. Do you see anywhere in the Scripture... Where Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Peter, and I told him no. But what Jesus did say to Peter is this. He said, but Peter, I have prayed for you. Peter, I'm not going to deliver you from the trial. But I'm going to bring you through the trial. And when Jesus told Peter that he had prayed for him, what Jesus was saying, I beg the Father for you. Do you hear me? Jesus was begged of the devil for Peter, but Jesus begged the Father to keep Peter. And he said, Peter, when you are converted. He said, Peter, what I'm telling you is this. Is that when you're converted, when you turn back, when you come back, when you return to the true worship of God. He said, I want you to go and I want you to stabilize. I want you to place firmly in the hearts, to fix in the hearts of them that you speak to that I am the Lord and that I have kept you and that all things are possible with me. That I did not forsake you in your weakness. I did not forsake you when you forsook me. But Peter, I beg God not to turn his back on you, but that he would restore you. How many times has the enemy spoken to your 
heart, when you've tripped up, <coughs> when you've failed, when things have gone differently than what you desired them to do, how many times has the enemy told you that you're no good? That there's no use in you serving God. That you might as well throw up your hands and quit. What I've come to tell you, that Jesus has prayed the same prayer for you that He prayed for Peter. Amen. That you would be strengthened. That you would be converted. He's going to allow you to be tested. He's going to allow you to be tried. But He's going to give you, amen, the power to come through it. Amen. And be renewed and be restored. You see, the enemy, he's asked for you. And he's asked for me. He's asked the Lord and he said, Lord, just as he's done in times of old, through others, through the Bible, through the Word of God, if you'll let me, what about Job, if you'll let me, I'll make him curse you to your face. And God led him. But Job didn't curse him. I want you to understand today, church, that your trial is not uncommon. I want you to understand today that your struggles are not uncommon. I want you to understand the issues that you have today in serving God. Amen. They're not unique to you. It's not because you've done anything wrong. It's not because that the Lord is trying to make a mockery of you. It's not that Jesus is mad with you. It's not that He just wants to make a spectacle of you. That's the enemy. The way the enemy can make a spectacle of you is if you quit. He makes a mockery of you because you said you were one thing. But when a little trouble came along, you became something else. But what I've come to tell you today, the Lord has prayed a prayer of keeping for you today. The Lord has prayed a prayer of stability for you today. The Lord has prayed the prayer of faith for you today. Amen. That your faith in Him would fail not. That you would understand my problem's not with Jesus. My problem is not with people. My problem is with the enemy. Amen. And therefore, I'm going to turn my back on what the devil is saying. I'm going to turn my attention to God. And I'm going to get through this thing. <coughs> prayer. It was a prayer that absolutely changed Peter's life. And Peter didn't understand fully what Jesus was saying to him. When he was telling him what the devil was going to do because it was going to happen sooner rather than later. Jesus was not giving him the forecast of things to come years down the road. Jesus was saying, He's on your heels now. He's coming for you now. And in a pivotal time in your life, He's going to make you understand who you are. Do you understand who you are today? Do you understand what you're about today? Do you understand just because you're struggling, it doesn't mean that you're backslidden. It means the enemy is trying to finish you. It means the enemy is trying to oppress you into a place to where you give up. Can I tell you this morning that it takes no effort whatsoever to give up? Can I tell you this morning it takes no effort whatsoever to fail? The only time in your life you will ever fail is when you quit. You hear me? The only time in your life you will ever fail is when you quit. But Jesus said, I'm praying that your faith fail not. 
What Jesus was saying, I'm praying that your faith won't quit. I'm praying that you won't quit because I'm not quitting on you. I know how low you're going to go. I know how depravity is going to come into your heart. I know how denial is going to wrap you up and try to squeeze the very life out of you. But I want you to understand, I put a heartbeat in you. Bless him, bless him. I put a heartbeat in you that the devil can't extinguish. Hear me this morning. Do you realize that when Jesus saved you, He put an undying presence in your life that the enemy cannot take. He gave you a life that the enemy cannot extinguish. The apostle went so far as to say that nothing can separate us from the wonderful love of God. And he went on to let, list several things that are common to man. Amen. He said, none of these things move me. None of these things shall separate me from the wonderful love of God. Not peril, not distress, not anything that the enemy can throw at me can separate me from the love of God. Because Jesus designed you... <coughs> That when He saved you, He meant to keep you. (coughs) But here we go. What the enemy understands is that he can't undo what Jesus did. But you can. If it were impossible for a person to backslide then this whole occasion with Peter is in vain. Because Satan was going to test Peter until he surrendered and changed allegiance. You hear me? And I know the dialogue. It's very prevalent in our area and very prevalent all about that once you get it, you got it. And it's forever. Forever. That's not true. Had that been true, Jesus would have said, Satan, uh, Peter, Satan's desired to have you, but don't worry about it. I've saved you. No matter what you do, it's going to be all right. But that's not what Jesus said, is it? Jesus said, I've prayed for you. And then Jesus said, when you're converted. So why do you have to be converted? Because Peter did sin against God. Because Peter did deny the Lord Jesus Christ. He denied a relationship with Him. He denied that He was His. He turned His back on Him, but Jesus said, Okay, I've already made intercession with the Father. And I'm giving you the opportunity to come back. To turn around and come back. You see, the enemy paints a picture to us. That when we get to a point and things are so bad in our life and we're on life support, spiritual life support, that the Lord won't have us. And that the Lord doesn't want to have any part of us. And that we've failed Him, that we've forsaken Him. Thank you, brother. And that we've done all of these things. Amen. That He doesn't want us anymore. But I come to tell you this morning that that price of blood came. Amen. At a great expense to Jesus Christ the Lord. And He didn't save you to give up on you. He'll go to the grave with you. My God. He'll walk. Amen. Through the corridors of hell with you. He'll walk through every trial. He'll walk through every temptation. He's with you when you fail. He's there to pick you up. He's there to tell you, I prayed for you. And when you convert and when you turn back and when you see the air of your way, I'm there. It's a prayer that changes everything in our life because the enemy wants to fill me with despair. But Jesus said, I've given you hope. I've given you life. And I'm I'm giving all of heaven, amen, to keep you. You see, I know this morning, beyond a shadow of a doubt, 
that in this congregation you're hanging on by a thread. There are those here this morning you're hanging on by a thread. You feel the despair. You feel the power of the sieve. You feel the power. And you feel what a sieve can do. But I've come to tell you there's one greater than the sieve this morning. There's one greater. Amen. That can fix what the enemy is trying to do to you. The enemy is trying to tell you, Amen, there is no God. He's trying to tell you that there's no reason for you to love God. Look at all those people who struggle that do love God. And I might as well go down this rabbit trail right here. Amen. That's why it's imperative. Amen. For those of us who do love God. Amen. To act like we love God. And quit moaning and groaning and griping, complaining about every little thing that's going wrong. Trouble is coming to us. Amen. But the blood of Jesus is uncommon. And the help of Jesus is uncommon. Amen. And it's greater than the trouble that faces us. And you say, well, you don't know where I've been. I don't have to go where you go. Amen. Jesus has already been there. Amen. And He knows what it is. And He knows how to bring us through it. If we'll trust Him. You see, we try. Help me, Lord. We try to frame our bitterness as a plea for sympathy. But it's really the bitterness of the soul that has said, I don't like what's happened to me. And I'm not happy about it. And why should I praise God? And why should I give glory to God when He's allowed these things to happen to me? Well, let me stop you right there. It's not God that did it to you. It is the penalty of sin that affects our lives every day. It is the penalty of sin. Amen. When Adam and Eve fell, that we have to endure all of these things that affects us. God didn't make Adam to die, and God didn't make Eve to die. When they were created, they were created in an eternal estate. But God said, if you partake of this fruit, if you eat of this fruit, you'll die. He didn't mean they were going to die physically right then. But He meant that something new was going to be opened up to them that they had never considered before. You'll die spiritually and death will stalk you naturally. Your problems are not because of Jesus. The tragedies and the travesties in your life and the hard luck in your life is not because of Jesus. It is your adversary. The devil. It's a sieve. He is trying to sift you. And he does not care how he gets to you as long as he gets to you. He doesn't care how he tears you apart. He doesn't care how he tears you down. It doesn't matter to Him how you treat other people. It doesn't matter how you view other people. It doesn't matter to Him what you think about them. All that matters to Him is that you fall into the pit of depravity more and more and more and more until you give up and you're willing to be thrown out with the trash. I'm preaching to you this morning. And I'm telling you the truth this morning. And you hear me because it doesn't matter what your age is this morning. The enemy is after you. Fill in your mind that your life is worthless. Fill in your mind that you don't have anything to live for. But I've come to tell you this morning, you've got everything to live for. Huh? You've 
got everything to live for. You've got everything to find peace and happiness for. And you'll find it in Jesus Christ the Lord. You're not going to find it in this secular world. You're not going to find it in a relationship with a person. You're not going to find it in that boyfriend, young lady. You're not going to find it in that girlfriend, young man. But you'll find it in Jesus Christ the Lord. You'll find a peace. You'll find a security. You'll find something that's able to keep you when hell rages against you. Amen. The word of the Lord will speak to you. And in the midst of your fire, there will be peace. In the midst of your furnace, there will be a fourth man. In the midst of your pain, there will be a comforter. In the midst of everything that you're going through, you'll find a friend that is faithful and true in the person of Jesus Christ the Lord. Satan has begged Jesus for you, but Jesus has said, listen, I prayed for you that you'll be converted. I prayed for you that you'll come through this. Now it's up to you to get through it. What Jesus has said is I've already made the road. I've already cleared the path. For you to get through it. Amen. Now how long it takes you to get through it's up to you. You see this morning. What has the devil got to offer you? Huh? A few laughs? No responsibility to yourself. No accountability for what you do. Give you the freedom to do whatever you want to do. When men are given unlimited freedom, unlimited freedom takes them to unlimited depravity. When there's no accountability... When there's no one to stand in the way and say, you better think about it. You know better. There's nobody to check you. And you resent anybody that checks you. Your problem's not with the person. Your problem's in your heart. Because you're being sifted. And you're not allowing the Lord to get you through the process of the sifting. Our children today are being inundated by anything and everything that you can imagine. Our children are looking and seeing how people that are committing suicide are being glorified. When they've been brought to the depths of depravity, suicide is all hope is lost. I've lost all hope. And I'm going to make my position clear today. You might fall out with me, but I'm going to make my position clear about suicide. And I'm going to make the Bible's position clear about suicide. When you take your own life, what does the commandment say? You shall not kill. And when you take your own life, You've put yourself in the position of God. And you have subjected yourself to an eternity without God. Now I'm going to make a little clause here. When people lose their minds, there's a time when it's between them and God. I'm not the judge. But I'm here to tell you that suicide, you're playing with fire. You're playing with an eternity without God. When you, when people commit suicide, there's no coming back. There's no repentance. But the enemy says, it's peace. 
How many people do you see today at the grave? They're telling people that were diehard sinners, that were diehard, infested with sin, and they say, rest in peace. They're finally resting in peace. I'm going to tell you the grave ain't peace. The grave without Jesus Christ is not peace. And the enemy may tell you that hell's going to be a party, but hell ain't going to be a party. Y'all listen to me today. I'm preaching to somebody this morning. I'm telling you, hell's not going to be a party. Hell, there's going to be nobody that likes you, nobody that cares about you. There's not going to be one good thing about hell. There's not going to be one positive about hell. Hell's going to be absolute misery, and it'll never end. But the enemy says it's where you want to be. I want you to understand that hell was not created for you. Hell was created for Satan and the fallen angels and that was it. But men and women have made a decision to expel God out of their life and given the Lord no other choice but to give them their wish. So it ain't Jesus that sends people to hell. You go of your own volition. So preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying He wants hell for you. And we walk around and we talk about, oh, I'm going through hell on earth. I'm going through hell on earth. No, no, you, you, you nor me, we can't even begin to imagine what hell is like. And what we're going through is tempered by the grace of Jesus Christ the Lord. It's tempered by the mercy of Jesus Christ the Lord. I've come to tell you today there's a better way. And I've come to tell you today that Jesus has prayed for you. I've come to tell you today it don't have to be this way. Yes, Thank you, Lord. Can I tell you when Jesus' prayer took effect for for Peter? After Peter had denied the Lord that third time and that rooster had crowed. Peter's standing by the fire and the Lord is over there being subjected to all kinds of things. And Peter catches his eye. And that's when the fullness of the prayer touched Peter. My God, I did just what he said I was going to do. But when Jesus looked at him, he didn't look to him with a stern, mean look and said, I told you so. He said, that look said, Peter, remember what I told you. I prayed for you. That look that Jesus cast Peter's way said, Peter, I love you. That look said, Peter, come back. That look said, Peter, hey man, I made the way, son, come on back. Hey man, I know you're going to have to seek me with tears, but I'll be there. I'll be there to receive you back into myself. That you can be my disciple and that you can change the lives of people. I'm telling you, Jesus saved you. Amen. To change the lives of people. Yes, he did, brother. I'm glad he got me, sir. Jesus redeemed you to get in people's way. Going to hell. I'm committed to getting in your way. If you're on the way to destruction, I'm, on, I'm committed to getting in your way. If you've got it in your mind that you want trouble, I'm committed to getting in your way. You may not like me. You may resent me for it. But if you're ever converted, you'll come up and say, Thank you, preacher. For getting in my way. Huh? And I'm going to say, thank Jesus for that prayer that changed everything in your life. I thank Jesus for the prayer that changed everything in my life. That when I was like Peter, I was ready to deny Him. I was ready to quit. Jesus said, don't quit, son. I prayed for you. I made a way for you. It don't matter what nobody else says, son. I love you. It don't matter what hell declares to you. My word's greater and I'm telling you, I love you. Been there. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Been there. Thank you, Lord. Are you going to allow the love of Jesus to touch your life? 
Or are you going to keep looking for things outside the realm of His grace that are going to bring you temporary happiness, happiness and eternal misery? You see, today what I want you to understand is whether you believe it or not, there is a heaven and there is a hell. And Jesus Himself said, Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, and few there shall be that will enter therein. Now it's not because Jesus doesn't want people to go to heaven. It is because people in the hardness of their hearts choose a broad way and a wide gate. Because they think Jesus is going to make exception. Can I tell you this and I'll close. I'm finding my parking space. Calvary was cruel. Calvary was brutal. There were no shortcuts. There were no deals. There were no exceptions. Satan did not make a deal with Jesus. Well, I'll give you a break here. And I'll give you a break there. Do you understand that sin required the life, the blood of the Son of God? It required the ultimate. There is no greater price. There is no greater thing that could have ever been done to redeem you and I than what Jesus. It cost God everything. You hear me? You think of it this way, that God literally did bankrupt heaven to redeem you and I because He gave His Son. So that you and I could be born again. And so you wonder why Jesus requires diligence from us. And you wonder why Jesus requires consecration from us. And you wonder why Jesus requires purity from us. Commitment. Holiness from us. It's because He didn't take a shortcut for you or me. So we shouldn't desire to take a shortcut to get to Him. He's prayed that prayer for you in your life. I'm connecting this morning. There may be those of you this morning that don't know why I preach what I preach, but I'm connecting this morning. I'm connecting to some hearts this morning. The Spirit is speaking to some hearts this morning that the devil sifted. And Jesus is softly telling you, That I have prayed that prayer for you that changes everything. You've just got to trust me. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. But if you'll trust me, I'll get you through it. And I'll bring you into a beautiful place in your life. Green pastures and cool waters. And give you a rest. That you may strengthen. And that you may be encouraged. But we got to go through the process to understand the power of who Jesus is. we got to go through the trial to understand the greatness of who Jesus is. we got to see the ugliness of what the devil is to understand the glory of who Jesus is. Jesus loves you this morning. I want to tell you this morning, Jesus loves you this morning. In a world full of hurt, in a world filled of confusion, Jesus is able to clear the fog. He's able to clear the clutter. If you'll come to Him and allow Him to be that one that turns you back to Him. Everyone standing, every head's bowed, and every eye's closed this morning.
The saints of God are praying. Asking the Spirit to do its work. There are lives in this very place this morning that are hanging in the balance. You may be here this morning and you may not be concerned about where you are with Jesus. Can I tell you, you're in the most dangerous place. You're in the most vulnerable place. You need Jesus to help you. You need to allow Him to wrap His arms around you. You need to allow His love to come and soften your heart. People may have caused your heart to get hard. You may have allowed people to allow your heart to get hard, but it's not going to be an excuse that we can offer to the Lord. Because the Lord will say, I was there to help you, and yet you sought me not. This morning, if you're here and you know you're going through that sifter and you need Jesus to help you, you need to hear that prayer that changes everything. Will you lift up your hand and say, Preacher, remember me. God, thank you for that hand. Is there anybody else this morning? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those hands that are going up this morning. I want you to understand that Jesus loves you today. And there's not one reason that He'll hesitate to help you. You just got to come to Him and say, I need you, Lord. I can't fix it myself. I can't do it on my own. I've tried. But Lord, I I, I want to learn to totally rely on you. And allow you to help me. Now if you've raised your hand this morning. I'm going to ask you. With all these others. To step out and come to the altar. And let's pray. And ask the Lord to deliver you. From the power of the seed. Come on. Come on. Let the Lord help you this morning. Come on. That's it. That's it. Come on. Let the Lord help you this morning. He won't turn you away. Come on. Come on. There's help. There's help. There's help. I promise you. I promise you there's help this morning. Oh God. Look here church. Oh God.